dreamed a dream in time gone by when hope was high and life worth living I dreamed that love would never die I dreamed that God would be forgiving then I was young and unafraid and dreams were made and used and wasted. There was no ransom to be paid, no song unsung, no wine untasted. But the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder. As they tear your hope apart As they turn your dream to shame He slept a summer by my side He filled my days with endless wonder he took my childhood in his stride But he was gone when autumn came And still I dream he'll come to me That we will live the years together Like the sun I might have known If God had granted me a son The summers die one by one How soon they fly on and on And I am old And will be gone Bring him joy. 
Well, wow. Um, <laughs> thank you for those incredible performances and for being with us here today. We are so, so excited to have you. So thank you. We're excited to be here. So thank yeah, you so yeah. much for having us. Um, so to get things started, um, I thought we could just do a few rapid fire questions. Um, if you can just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. So Kate, if you want to go first and then Nick. Great. Okay. Um, okay, first one. Favorite song in Lame Is? One Day More. Bring Him Home. <laughs> Favorite song you don't sing? Ooh. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't like any of the other ones. The people song. The people song. <laughs> okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. Um, okay. Last thing you Googled? Um, the full moon lunar eclipse that's happening today. Oh. Yeah. How to properly tie a Windsor knot. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good. I think I did it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it. <laughs> Looks totally great. Did um, favorite city you have performed in, not including Denver? Seattle. Nashville. Uh, okay, and last one, dream role in any musical. Mm, um, I'm gonna say Mother in Ragtime in 20 years. <laughs> um, uh, Phantom in the Phantom of the Opera. Oh. <laughs> they know that one. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> uh, perfect. Okay, um, so now we'll get into some um, more in-depth questions. So if you can both tell us a little bit more about how you got involved with Les Mis and what the audition process was like. Sure. Um, well, I first auditioned for this show in, I think, April of 2016 and did not originally get cast uh, and waited for maybe three or four months uh, and it was kind of down to the wire for the casting team, I think. They're about to start rehearsals in a couple weeks. So I went back in for another audition that I didn't realize was like, kind of a final callback and I started my journey with Les Mis as a member of the female ensemble understudying Fontaine and in March of this year, I bumped up and started playing the role full time. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. And, um, I started, my, my initial audition was in April, um, and I actually, I think, was one of the last people that was cast, um, and over the course of five callbacks, um, and then finally booked, booked the role. Booked it. So here we are. Yes. Well, congrats to you both. Yeah. Yeah. I saw on Wednesday you were both amazing in the Thank show. Thank you. Um, Nick, can you tell us a little bit more what it's like to play such an iconic role of Jean Valjean, and are there any characters, or are there any actors who have played the role in the past that inspired your performance? Sure. It's very easy. No. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it is very demanding. Uh, yes. But it also, because there's a lot of responsibility that comes with playing this character, so many people have um, you know, amazing men who have come before me that have played this role, Colm Wilkinson, um, you know, Hugh Jackman in the movie, you've got, you know, all of these amazing artists. And you also have a responsibility to the fans of Les Miserables that have seen the show, that know what this character is, and so it also is fun to kind of make it your own. Yeah. And you have to make it your own, and I feel like I have made it my own. Um, you know, uh, 
But I would say some of the people that I look up to, obviously, is Colm. Is Colm. I mean, he started the whole thing. You have to look up to the man who originated the role. Yeah. But then also I did a regional production of it about nine years ago. And so the two gentlemen that played um, Valjean when I actually played Marius, really I looked up to because I saw how they made it their own and how they sang differently and, and stuff like that. So it, it was a good prep, yeah, for yeah. this. Oh, that's great. Um, Kate, uh, Fantine makes a huge impact in the beginning of the show. Um, how do you prepare each night to start off the show so strong? Do you have any special rituals or, mom or things you do before each night? Um, I think it's kind of absorbing the energy of the rest of the cast because it is true that I am introduced and then like about 30 minutes later I'm dying in a hospital bed, so it's over very quickly. Spoiler yeah. alert. Yeah. Oh, sorry if you haven't seen it. <laughs> Spoiler alert! I'm dying. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, but I would not, I wouldn't say that I'm the only person making a high impact at the top of the show. There's really no such thing as easing gently into yes. a performance of Les Mis. Right. Um, so I think it's just um, meeting my fellow castmates where they are when they start the show um, because we all kind of have to give 100%. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, and this can be for both of you, if you both want to answer just one. Um, so this show has so, so much history. Uh, it not only takes place in 19th century, 19th century France, but it's also based on Victor Hugo's 1,500-page novel mm -hmm. from 1862, and that is a lot of content. How have you gone about preparing for your roles, and is there any extra research you did before you started? Uh, I did read the book. It took oh, wow. me months. Uh, <laughs> but I did read the book because, I mean, that's a natural resource. You have the original words that Victor Hugo wrote that are right there mm -hmm. that can tell you everything you need to know about the characters. And you know, yes, you can take stuff, but there's there's one line uh, in in the book that Javert actually says to Valjean. The way that he recognized Javon, uh, Jean Valjean at one point is because he walks with a limp. And it was literally just one line that is written. And so I Adapt, adapted that into my character. So as I age through the show, when we get into it, when I'm in older age, uh, I start walking with a limp. And it was literally stuff like that that I was able to take out of the book and, and put into my character. And, and also just to see the way that you know, Valjean is so broken at the beginning and, and how everybody treats him really helps to inform my character and journey every night. So for me, that was truly what I did. What he said. I don't have a limp, though. Oh. Did you also read the book? Yes, I did. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. That's amazing. Yeah, I was first introduced to it uh, when I was a sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know the musical at that point. And we watched the, the very famous 10th anniversary production concert version of it mm -hmm. um, in bits and pieces in class. And so, yeah, that was when the love affair started. And when we started rehearsal, the first day, we all walked in with the novel sitting at our binders. So oh, wow. they gave us the novel, and they were like, <laughs> get ready. <laughs> Some go. light reading. Well, yeah. um, so then, do either of you remember the first time you saw the show? I, I saw it, uh, I think it was 2014, oh. in London. I saw it in the West End. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that's the only other professional production that I've seen or been involved with at all before this one. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I saw it. On, in the tour version in 1996, <laughs> five, uh, when it played my hometown in Tempe, Arizona. So that was really, really great that I got to see it there and sat in the top balcony and was just amazed. OK, so Les Mis first premiered in Paris in 1980, almost 40 years ago. And it's still a worldwide success. Uh, why do you think the show has really stood the test of time? Um, I think that um, even though it, it takes place such a long time ago, there are a lot of very important and pertinent issues that the show deals with that's happening for us societally right now. There's a lot of members of um, the cast, a lot of characters that are ostracized persons and oppressed, and there's a lot of that going on in the world that we experience every day. So I think um, audience members either find it really relatable or they... Um, experience a really important lesson over and over and over again of um, looking out for people who are more vulnerable than you. And um, so it's important for both of us, I think, to be able to tell the stories of these characters that do experience that oppression because it is so important now. 
I don't know if you have anything. To yeah, add no, to I would say that. And then the music is what brings people back. I mean, these are songs that you know they've been on the radio. I mean, it's, it's pop culture at this point. So I think that people come back to see the show because they have a love for the show, along with connecting with these characters that are just a fight for the human spirit, trying to make the world a better place. So when did both of you get uh, first involved with theater? And was there anyone that inspired you to start acting? You. All right. <laughs> you, you took uh, the breath I, first. I first got involved with theater uh, when I was in uh, fifth grade. Uh, I, I would always growing up singing in choirs and things like that. Uh, seventh grade, sorry. And I ended up doing a production of an opera called A Mall in the Night Visitors around Christmas. And that was kind of what sparked it. And then I went and saw a field trip of a production of Cinderella. And I was like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> They're doing what I love. Um, and then it just kind of took off from there. And ever since then, that's what I've been doing. Uh, I was a late bloomer. I didn't really do musical theater until high school, actually. My first show was when I was a freshman. I did Hello, Dolly. It was in the ensemble. I had a lot of straw hats. <laughs> um, but it was great, yeah. And I remember like waiting in the wings before the show started one night with our, like now I know, very subpar high school orchestra playing the overture. <laughs> and uh, just experiencing the feeling of anticipation before going on stage, I was like, oh my god, people do this as a career. I want to do this. So yeah, yeah, it was then. Very cool. Um, and both of you have been in, in lots of other shows. What's it like to be in Les Mis versus like past shows that you've been in? It's huge. This show's yeah. huge. And, and because you are meeting fans at the stage door that have either seen it before or it's their first time seeing it, and so you have a responsibility to them, but then you also have a responsibility to the work, but then you also just get to do Les Mis. I mean, <laughs> it's been running for almost 40 years. I yeah. mean, and so to say, I'm in Les Miserables is pretty cool. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, yeah. we all have, some of, some of us in, in the company have swag and, you know, which is, you know, so we'll have a jacket or a hat on and we'll walk in and they'll be like, are you, are you in the show? <laughs> like, yeah, just a little bit. You know, so I mean, it, it's fun. It's just a little bit. For us. Just, just a little just bit. Just most of the show. I'm like five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, switching gears a little bit, what is the best advice either of you have been given? So I, I would say probably just to um, release any expectations you have about where you need to be um, and to just do your job, you know, um, with integrity, whether that's for us performers, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to find work and obviously we're very lucky to be involved in the production that we're in right now, but um, whether the work that you're doing is preparing for a role or it's being perseverant and getting yourself up for auditions and, and um, you know, taking the time when you're not in a show to work on yourself, but it's all about the process and not necessarily the destination. Um, I, I would second that. Okay. Perfect. Cool. <laughs> 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 Plus one. Um, okay, what is your favorite part of telling this profound story every night? For me, it's, it's getting to show the journey of Valjean, to show how broken a man can be at the beginning of the show. All he holds on to is his name and a single piece of his soul that's left. And it's not until the bishop forgives him that that all breaks apart and completely is, his entire world is flipped upside down. Everything is decimated. And he has to rebuild himself from the ground up. And that by the end of the show, he's finally found forgiveness, not only for everybody that he's come in contact with, but also for himself. And I think that telling that story, there are people that can connect with that and that need that in their lives. And I think that that, for me, is what is the joy for me. Um, I think the reason that I said One Day More is my favorite song is because of how iconic it is. Um, and so um, we do it a lot. We do the show a lot. We've done it hundreds of times <laughs> yeah. now. Um, but 331. Oh, wow. That, that's night. the count. Yeah. OK, 331. Um, <laughs> so that's a lot of One Day More. But um, <laughs> if you can really like, make yourself present in that musical moment, it it's very overwhelming to be a part of it, to be marching in that V formation and in the periphery to see the red flag waving. And we're um, really lucky to be part of a very talented group of people. So there's never a night when that moment isn't like breathtaking, even being a part of it. So um, that's probably my favorite theatrical moment of the show. 
And I think that that's also so cool about this production of Les Mis is that we have such an amazing cast. It's a young cast. We have an energy that we bring on stage every single night. But the other thing that's so amazing about it is that you can look at any single person at any point in the show and somebody is, has something going on. They're invested, they are creating their own stories, and every, it, th that's what I love about this company is that we, we all support each other, but they, uh, we also, we all have our own you know, ideas and, and things happening each night. Everyone's taken a lot of responsibility yeah. for their roles, and I mean, it's really great to be a principal performer, but this show is, um, like the engine of the show is the ensemble, mm -hmm. and they're always on stage, and they're always committed, and they're really fun to watch. So if you go to the show, make a point to, to check out what's happening behind the immediate action, because there's always a lot. Yeah. Um, and then, so what, what would you say is the most challenging part of the show? Um, I have to experience a lot of emotion in a very short amount of time. Um, and it's definitely the kind of thing that I've gotten used to, but um, there are some nights when it's just, it's not really there. And so um, I would say that's probably most challenging for me is finding consistency with that because it is such a tragic story, um, Fontaine's story, and I am not a very tragic person in life in general. So um, that is difficult, but um, very fulfilling. Yeah. For me, I'd say just the stamina to do a three-hour musical every single night is is a lot. It's hard, and it's making sure you get enough rest and making sure that you're warmed up. And you know, on those days where you're not feeling great, figuring out how to still push through and give the audience 100%. And you guys are covering a lot of cities in your tour. Do you find that different audiences have different responses, or anything different when you go to a new city? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we we just spent some time in Canada actually, and their um, their theater etiquette is just different than ours. So. Um, we had a lot of quiet but still very appreciative audiences, which is not something that we're used to. You know, we feel kind of like rock stars at certain moments of the show because yeah. as you should. Like, Usually the crazy. overture starts and all of a sudden there's yeah. this yell from the crowd and everybody <laughs> yeah. on stage is like, all right, let's go, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. So you just have to kind of get used to different energies from the audiences, but we've never been to a city where they haven't loved what we're doing. And leapt to their feet right at the end of the show. Yeah. Always so. a standing up. Oh, yeah. I'm switching gears a little bit more. Um, have you had any on stage or backstage mishaps? And if so, how did you adapt? <laughs> I have. Uh, so there's a, there's a moment on the barricade where I have to let Javert go. And, uh, but I still have to pretend to shoot him. So I have a, a rifle, because we do use live ammunition that's blanks. Uh, and so, and so I let him go. I hold the gun for a moment. I point it up to the air, and I fire. And the minute that I pulled it up into the air, somehow the strap that was on the gun got between the firing mechanism. So when I went to fire, nothing happened because it got stuck. And there's a prop, our prop uh, master, Kurt, is standing off in the wings, and he has another gun ready to go in case that happens. And I was up in this position. He heard it. He went to get his gun. And right at that moment, I lowered my gun back into the wing, <laughs> and he shot. <laughs> So uh, Valjean is a horrible sight uh, <laughs> because I, act, uh, I didn't actually kill Javert that night, but uh, <laughs> that was probably, yeah, for me, that was the worst onstage mishap that has happened so far. Knock on wood. We'll see. Um, before I took over the role, when I was still understudying, uh, it was the first time that I ever went on. So I was feeling very anxious and excited in Nashville, actually, mm -hmm. next favorite city. And um, something happened. Oh, it was a life alert went off in the house. I think somebody with a life alert had come to the show the night before, but left the alarm on accident. So they were like at their house trying to find their life alarm, and they like kept pressing like find my life alert, and it was just like going off in the, in the audience. So I made the entrance into the factory. I was so like overstimulated by what was happening to me as my my first my like principal debut that I didn't notice it was happening but everybody in the ensemble was making real weird faces at me like what is going on and um, 
so at the end of the factory scene, when Fantine gets thrown out of the factory, she ends up upstage, sitting on the ground, ready to go for I Dream to Dream. So this entire time, I've been like psyching myself up for the big song. And I get to my spot, and the spotlight hits me, and I hear our stage manager's voice over the loudspeaker to the whole audience, like, we're going to hold the show, ladies and gentlemen, like, as I'm going, <sighs> uh, <laughs> and uh, so I had to get up and walk walk off stage and stand there. Uh, it was just the weirdest break in like yeah. momentum. Um, so they brought the curtains down and I just kind of stood there for two minutes like trying to figure out how to keep it going. I didn't yeah. know, I mean. Um, so then I had what we call my Tony performance now where I like went back out and sat myself down once they figured it out <laughs> and like the curtain rose and the song started and then I, I got to do it. but. That was probably the biggest one yes. and very memorable. Yeah, <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. Um, there was also one on the first uh, one of our on like our opening night in Providence, oh Rhode yeah. Island. We got to the very end of the show. I mean, literally, we are in the last song, yeah. and we hear, "Help! Stop! Doctor! Please!" Somebody had been crying so hard. <laughs> but still decided it was a good idea to eat peanut M&Ms. And they literally <laughs> put one in their mouth, were sobbing, sucked in, and started choking. <laughs> so we had to stop the show. We are within the moments of ending the show, we had to stop the show, and then we all had to file back on, but yeah. yeah. That, there aren't that many. We have a great crew. We have a yeah. great group of people. That there aren't that many uh, mishaps that no. happen. And those yeah. weren't our fault either. Yeah, those no. weren't our fault. <laughs> yeah. You guys adapted great. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then kind of along those lines too. So for the songs you're not in, like when you're backstage, like how do you stay in character? Are you just hanging out or? As soon as I pass away, I can uh, kind of. I can kind of let go of Fontaine for a little while. She does come back at the end of the yes. show, so I don't really have to worry about that so much. Yeah. I don't know about you. Um, most of the time I'm not on stage, I'm changing costume or doing makeup or yeah. doing something like that. So there's always an element of keeping that there. Um, but also we've done 331 performances of it. So I figured out how to get back into it, take that moment before so I can walk back on stage and sing Bring Him Home. So we do have some questions on the Dory. Um, I did want to open up to the audience. If anyone has an audience question, if you want to come up to this mic, we can form a little line. <laughs> so um, I'm curious what songs you chose to sing for your auditions for these roles and why you chose them. Oh. Well, um, you know, for the first initial audition, I sang Memory from Cats. So there's that. And then from that point on, they give you um, material from the show to sing. And when I went in for my audition, I was just given material from the show. So I had to sing the soliloquy, bring him home, uh, and who am I? And then I also had to prepare the confrontation for my final callback. So you mentioned the, the, the cast doing things in the background, and, and we actually got to see you last night, and it was excellent. Amazing. Um, and there were a lot of really f fun bits. What is your favorite, like just little one second bit that, that people do in the show? Well, I, I mean, I'm kind of in a, um, a special position with that because I got to be in the ensemble for a while. And I think my favorite scene was always the Paris scene when you're first introduced to Eponine and you see the Tenardiers again after they've sung Master of the House at the end. But there's just so much going on in that scene. And what's cool about it is that every ensemble member has kind of been given a different costume and a different character. Um, and people get real serious about it. So like, there is true commitment happening back there from a lot of them. So that one's really fun. I like coming into the factory because there is that level of power that you, you walk into as, as the mayor. And so to come into the factory and, and you know say my piece, and then as I walk up, I always have the men's ensemble that come rushing up to me, asking me questions. And yesterday, uh, yesterday was my birthday, and okay. so I yes, ran. Yes, happy belated I, birthday to Nick. It was his birthday thank yesterday. Um, <laughs> thank you. But I went walking up the stairs of the factory at the matinee, and they all come rushing up to me. And I was like, what? And they all started singing happy birthday to me. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. Get back to work. You know, so that was great. That was great. That's awesome. 
introduce yourself. Uh, um, yeah. My name is Josh. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and thanks Josh, for coming here today. J Josh is act actually, yeah. um, oh. my yeah. question was <laughs> um, yes, specifically for Mr. Cartel, oh. because it's such a very um, <laughs> serious role. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you have to do it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Is there any time that you've ever broken or like on stage, like like laughed or anything? Yeah. Um, Thank you. I'm gonna say that. <laughs> should, should we explain so who Josh is? That's Josh Davis. Josh is our Javert in the show. Yes. <laughs> um, and the answer is never. <laughs> never. Can I talk? I'm going to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, you can talk about that, because there are moments where. Mm. So, <laughs> Nick is such a happy guy. I am. He is. And as soon as he starts smiling, he can't stop. So I, I mean, the most um, tragic and emotion-filled moment of the show for me is at the end of the docks when like, they're about to take me to jail. I don't know what Josh does when he comes on stage, but he did something one day to make Nick start laughing. And <laughs> sometimes we'll just look at each other and if and we're in a mood, <laughs> if we're in a mood, then it just it just happens. But the thing that I will say is that what always pulls me back, like if ever I get to that point, especially when we're in that doc scene, yeah. she actually spits on me. And she will yeah. and she will spit in my face and it immediately pulls me and I'm like, all right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's really difficult, you know, when you're trying to cry. I know. <laughs> and he turns around with a full grin on his face and <laughs> sings the line. Never to you. again. So oh Never okay. Do you ever experience bleed with your character's emotions coming through and sort of you feeling the character's emotions or is it just all simulated and you've done it enough that that doesn't happen? Um, well, the last couple, like the last month, um, I, my grandma passed away and I thought I was fine. I thought I was totally fine and I didn't really cry about it but I always cry in the show and that the night right after it happened I wasn't sure after I got out there and started crying if I was going to be able to make it through. So there are definitely moments where if, if something's happening for you in your personal life that um, has affected you emotionally in any way. This show can be very therapeutic for, for that sort of thing but it can, I mean there's a very fine line that you can't really cross over. Um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes it's, it's really difficult to, to meet that line and not exceed it. I'm, I'm not sure if... Yeah, no, I, I will totally second that. Um, especially if you're angry about something, you know, there, there are those moments. For me, uh, my mom passed away the day before my final callback for this show. And so to sing Bring Him Home every night is emotional. To sing the end of the show is emotional. It's... it's uh, and it is, it's, a, it's incredibly therapeutic to do this show and I think it's been some of the best therapy in order to do the show because there are moments where you can cry and you can let that emotion out that sometimes you might not be able to do outside of the theater. It also teaches you how to access those emotions though too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there are those few performances where it's dangerous, um, but then once you get past that point, you can remember what it feels like to, um, to have your, your chest constrict like that. And uh, you know, the more often that it happens, the more easy it is to find it, so. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. If you could play another character in Les Mis for one night, would you and who would it be? Oh. <clears throat> am, am I going first? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I've always wanted to be a bass. So, um, <laughs> probably Javert. <laughs> and I would say, I would say I would like to play Javert too. Yeah. Oh. Watch out, Josh. I'd like to play the other side. <laughs> Coming for you. <ya. laughs> um, so, I'm someone who inspires to be in the arts, and I'm curious because there's a lot of trial and error in starting a career. Is there something you're really glad you did when you first started really putting yourself out there? And is there something you kind of wish you'd done differently, maybe not put as much energy into, or oh, you know, don't worry about that, just do this? What is your advice in that? Like something you're super glad you did at the start of your career and something you wish you'd maybe done differently? I wish that I would have gotten into more dance, for me, um, especially in musical theater. Uh, I can move, but I'm not a dancer, and I wish that I could do, I wish I could tap dance more. I wish I could you know, do all those things. Um, 
I don't think that there was anything that I would say, I'm sorry that I put my energy into, because I feel like everything that I did in some way, shape, or form was a learning experience. Um, it was you know, a way to figure out, all right, this is the right thing to do, or this is the wrong thing to do. Um, so that was, that's me. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, that's a really good question, but there's no formula for success, in my opinion. So um, anything that you might experience as an aspiring performer was meant for you to experience. Um, so I would just say that it's important for you to have patience and to be kind to yourself, because there are probably a lot of people in the world who won't be that nice to you. Um, but there are a lot of people who will be incredible and super helpful. And um, yeah, to just look for the lesson in everything, because it's always there. I'm curious, as you're singing like in a, a forum like this, or even on stage, like are you looking at the audience in their eyes, like directly making eye contact? Or especially as you're in this big emotional journey where the audience may or may not be like feeling it quite the same, is it awkward to be looking at someone who's just sort of like looking up at you, or do you kind of focus more generally in the theater? Um, in some houses, that's, that's impossible to be able to make eye contact with people just because of how dark it is or how far away they are. But like here in Denver, we're close to the first like maybe 15 rows. So I, I can see facial features and um, I find it helpful because so much of this show um, is is a lesson, you know? So many of the songs that you're singing, so many of the arguments or conversations that you have with people through song are about this struggle of the human spirit and things that we've all experienced before. So I'm not afraid to make eye contact with people. Yeah, and, and at the beginning of the show especially, you know, um, I kind of break the fourth wall a bit and I, I am singing to the audience and I'm yelling at the audience and, and to be able to have those people that you can, and they're like, oh. <laughs> He's looking at me now? Why? Like, um, and, and it, it is. It's because we have a lesson to tell, and we have a story that we're trying to get across. And if we can connect with people on that level, then it just makes it better for us, and it makes I feel like it makes it a more riching experience for the audience. It's always um, it's a goal of a performer, I think, to make the audience feel like they are part of what's happening, because uh, that's really kind of how the lessons stick. I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. You said you've done 331 shows. What has been like the most memorable moment? For me, the most memorable moment, and it wasn't in a show. It was actually when we were still in rehearsal. And it was, um, we were going into our day of sits probe. And a sits probe is it's the first time that the actors are singing with an orchestra. So we are all on stage, and we are walking up to just stand microphones, and we're singing with this beautiful orchestra. And sitting in front of us are, is Claude Michel Schoenberg and Aline Boublil, who wrote the show. And to have that experience of singing their music for them, and it, it is a moment that I will never forget. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. I would say mine's probably in that, that same time period when we were in previews in Providence, and the entire creative team of Les Miserables came to see us do that. And, we had all, um, you know, her, heard the, the reputation that Cameron McIntosh has. Um, he's a very particular man and knows exactly what he likes. And when he came into our note session the day after he saw our show, he didn't have anything negative to say about us as an ensemble. Um, and so that was very cool. I mean, we were all excited about that, but then as soon as he left, our associate director was like, I just want you guys to know that I've never heard him say that before. Wow. So um, knowing, knowing that and knowing how strong of a group of performers we are, um, you know, gives you a lot of pride for the work that you do. Yeah, that's a huge compliment yeah. for Cameron Mack. <laughs> um, and then, so I'm assuming you're not always listening to Les Mis when you're not in the show. You, is there any other, um, you know, uh, current musical cast recordings you're listening to, or any songs you listen to to like, get pumped up before the show? Or I'm a bad musical theater person. I don't like really listen to cast yeah. recordings unless yeah. I need to for a show. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of Fleetwood Mac in the dressing oh. rooms lately. That's so great. That. <laughs> I just kind of put on Spotify yeah. and just how the mood hits me. Sometimes it's jazz, sometimes it's big band, sometimes it's, you know, pop, whatever. Whatever I need to pump me up in order to do the show or whatever mood I'm in, mm -hmm. that's kind of what 
pushes me in the right direction. Okay. I was wondering, if you happened to find yourself you know, in the midst of a group of people who were involved in technology, what sort, of, <laughs> what sort of technology improvements would help people in musical theater? Oh, oh. very good question. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hmm. I, we're kind of set. I mean, I feel well, good. Well, I, I think something that would be amazing, and I know that the technology is sort of there, but I don't think it's been, it's been, you know, immediately, or I don't know how to say that. But uh, when we go, to, when we get in every city, we have a local crew that we pick up in every city. So we travel with a crew of about 20 to 25 people, and then we pick up maybe about another 50 to 75 people to help us do the show every night, and sometimes. But a lot of the time, it's the spotlights that are on somebody, like it's a local person, and they're having to say, all right, you need to be on Valjean. You need to be on Valjean right now. And the spotlight will come up over there, and I'm here. So if there was technology that you could wear something on your costume that they could just put up the light, and it would be on you as a spotlight, I think that would be amazing. Yeah, OK. That would be super cool. I'm, I'm technologically challenged, so maybe just like somebody helping me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can find someone okay, here. Okay, great, awesome. Come yeah. talk to me after. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was great. a good question. Yeah, I have to think about that. So, thank you both thank so you. much for being here, and um, yeah, thank you. If we could give them a round of applause. Thank you.